Coming up on our newscast, Koreans and foreigners alike join in numerous events held around the nation to celebrate the birth of the Korean alphabet, Hangul. While North Korea is busy with last-minute touches to its grand military parade, Human Rights Watch sheds light on how the regime is forcing its citizens to toil under harsh conditions to prepare for such events. The Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet, which formed an alternative peaceful political process when the country was on the verge of civil war in 2013, wins the Nobel Peace Prize. All this on this edition of Primetime News. It's 10 p.m. on a Friday here in Korea, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Daniel Che for Primetime News. It's a national holiday here in Korea today. We celebrate the birth of the Korean alphabet Hangul. Our Kim ji shows us some of the events held in Seoul to mark this special location. Koreans and foreigners have come together today in Seoul's iconic Gwangwama Plaza to participate in various events to celebrate the birth of Hangul. Hangul, or the Korean alphabet, was created by King Sejong the Great in the 15th century. Being here on Hangul Day makes me ruminate on the preciousness of the Korean language and how King Sejong was able to create the Korean alphabet. It was a love for his people that prompted him to create a way for them to easily read and express their thoughts. And it wasn't just Koreans enjoying the festivities. The growing popularity of both Hangul and the Korean language is prompting the government to continue its support to promote them overseas. On our Facebook page, President Park Geun-hye stated the value of Hangul would shine even more when it's treasured by others. Prime Minister Hwang Yuan echoed the sentiment at a celebratory event, marking the 569th Hangul Day. A country's dignity can be measured by the quality of its spoken and written words, which are important tools for communication for its people. With this in mind, the government will continuously make efforts to improve proper usage of the Korean language and further increase efforts to spread its usage worldwide. Hwang said the government will continue to support overseas Korean language institutions such as the King Sejong Institute, which currently have around 140 branches in 54 countries. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Well, as seen in that interview, Nirja, who is an associate professor for a Center for Korean Studies, just one of the many foreigners who enjoyed Hangul Day in Seoul. Our Kim Min Ji takes a closer look at a week-long program that takes foreigners to cultural sites in and around Korea and gives them a chance to experience Korean food and music. To experience a bit of Korean culture, this group of foreigners is learning the basic patterns of the martial art Taekwondo. Not only are they taking the class in Korea, the language they speak in class is Korean. The participants are the top students at the King Sejong Institute, a Korean language school with branches all over the world, and they're in the country for a week-long cultural program after winning selection in their home countries. The program, hosted by the Culture Ministry, the King Sejong Institute Foundation and Arirang TV, is being held to coincide with Hangul Day, which falls on Friday and celebrates the Korean alphabet. We have invited the top students studying Korean at our institutes around the world to give them the opportunity to experience Korean culture and allow them to use the Korean they've learned. One of the main events on the program was a Korean speech contest that took place Wednesday. 
After going through the preliminary rounds in their home countries, 13 students made it to the final round and were given an opportunity to show off their Korean language skills. The competition was intense and the contestants spoke on a range of topics, from their dreams to what they like about Korean culture. During the one-week program, they will also visit cultural heritage sites in Korea where they will be able to learn about the Korean history, taste the cuisine and try their hands on traditional games. Program organizers hope that not only will the participants be able to brush up on their Korean language skills during their stay, they will have the opportunity to discover Korea for themselves with the hope that the experience will strengthen their love for and interest in Korea and its culture. Kim min -si, Arirang News. Turning to other stories now, North Korea is putting the last-minute touches on what is expected to be a grand military parade in Pyongyang on Saturday to mark the 70th anniversary of its ruling Workers' Party. According to our Kim Hyun bin the regime will almost certainly flaunt its latest weaponry, including a submarine-launched ballistic missile, before a very important guest from China. North Korea has a history of revealing new weaponry at its military parades in April 2012. Pyongyang unveiled its KN-08 intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time. In 2013, the North paraded what is said were miniaturized nuclear weapons inside backpacks, although it was widely discredited by military experts. The parade on Saturday is likely to see another form of weaponry, real or not, make its military debut. Experts are focused on whether North Korea will roll out miniaturized nuclear warheads, which the regime claims to have developed. They are also looking out for evidence North Korea has submarine-launched ballistic missiles that Pyongyang claimed to have successfully tested in May. The missiles could be tipped with a nuclear warhead. If the North had the technical ability to do that, it would represent a dangerous new security threat to the South. North Korea will likely display its KN-09 cruise missile, which has a range of up to 200 kilometers. If fired from the border, Seoul and South Korea's military headquarters in Taejeon will be well within its range. The North's KN-09 could strike most of our military's runways. Without this ability, North Korea's conventional weapons could potentially overpower us in a conflict scenario. Meanwhile, Liu Wen-sun, China's fifth-in-command, arrived in Pyongyang on Friday to take part in the anniversary ceremony. Liu led the Chinese delegation and is scheduled to stay for four days to meet with North Korean officials and exchange views on bilateral relations. This is the first time since 2011 for a member of the Chinese Communist Party's Politburo Standing Committee to visit North Korea. Diplomatic sources in Beijing expect Kim Jong-un to meet with Liu, but experts say it remains unclear if the encounter will help Pyongyang-Beijing relations. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory message to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Friday. According to Chinese state-run media, she extended warm congratulations to Kim, saying that Beijing and Pyongyang have maintained a great friendship and added he wishes the relationship could strengthen and prosper. Bilateral ties between the reclusive state and China have remained strained since the North's third nuclear test back in 2013. Now, while North Korea has been making preparations for the massive public ceremony, a new report released Thursday by Human Rights Watch reveals more condemning evidence of the communist state's abuses. That the country's economy and the ruling class was built and sustained by the blood, sweat and tears of forced labor. According to the watchdog, most North Koreans must perform forced labor at some point in their lives at logging camps, mines and farms under difficult and dangerous conditions. Such experience results in physical and mental injuries, malnutrition, starvation, and growth deficiencies even. A UN commission also found the conditions to be worse in prison camps where forced labor is used for political coercion. Phil Robertson, the Asia Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch, said the UN Security Council should act now to demand the reclusive regime put an end to its abusive economic system built on exploitation.
South Korea, China, and Japan say they will work on expanding regional financial ties and vowed closer coordination in monitoring risky developments in the markets. Seoul's finance chief also called for support for a South Korea-led Asian Development Bank, or the ADB. Shin Se-min brings us this report. The finance chiefs of Korea, China, and Japan have agreed to gauge the spillover effects and risks to the regional economy in light of lower-than-expected global economic growth. Meeting on the sidelines of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors gathering in Peru on Thursday, the three sides discussed ongoing economic developments, including falling growth prospects and the recent market volatility. They also agreed to clearly communicate actions aimed at fostering confidence in their respective financial markets. On top of that, the ministers discussed ways to further develop regional financial cooperation within the ASEAN Plus Three and said they would work together to ensure financial stability. Korea's finance minister Che Gyeonghwan also asked for China and Japan's support for the establishment of Seoul's envisioned Northeast Asia Development Bank. The bank would be designed to support North Korea's economic development in exchange for Pyongyang's denuclearization with the help of other member nations from the so-called six-party nuclear talks, which include China and Japan. Thursday's meeting was the second between the three ministers this year. It's hoped that the talks laid the groundwork for a successful summit between the leaders of the three countries. The summit is expected to be held in Seoul at the end of this month or in early November. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Staying in Peru, Korea's finance minister Choi kyung hwan also met with the managing director at the Moody's Global Ratings Agency on the sidelines of the G20 meeting. During that meeting, Korea's top economic policymaker expressed hopes that the credit rating agency would soon boost Korea's sovereign credit rating, while reiterating Seoul's commitment to revitalizing its economy and governmental structural reform. The agency credited Korea for reducing liability within its public institutions in such a short amount of time and said it supports Korea's efforts to push forward with its political policies. Moody's improved Korea's rating outlook from stable to positive back in April. A former White House official says South Korea has a favorable chance of becoming a member of the recently agreed Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, but it's not that simple. Also Young explains why Matthew Goodman feels Seoul will have to wait a while to join the world's largest trade bloc. For the past few weeks, Korea has expressed keen interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. However, joining the world's largest trading bloc may prove to be less than straightforward, according to Matthew Goodman, a former White House official. Speaking to a local news agency on Thursday, he said that Korea should be on the top of the list in terms of gaining membership, but that it's too late to join the first round. Having reached a landmark deal this week, it's likely that the 12 member countries will take a year or two to ratify terms before considering new members for the second round. Goodman said Korea should have joined the TPP in the beginning stages of negotiations, as it would have largely benefited from the historic agreement, which accounts for more than a quarter of the world's trade volume. This means Korea will be excluded from the tariff cuts on nearly 18,000 categories and increased access to markets with a combined population of almost 800 million. The former White House official also said that missing out on these benefits will have negative effects on the Korean economy, but are unlikely to be seriously damaging. However, he emphasized it is in Korea's best interest to become a part of the regional bloc. So just what will it take? Goodman says Korea will have to show it's willing to achieve high standards and substantial liberalization. Woo Seung, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories, former FIFA Vice President Chung Mong Jun had some strong response to sanctions from the organization's Ethics Committee. Our Yi Ji Won shares with us the once hopeful FIFA presidential candidate's latest statement. Chung Mong Jun released a statement on Friday to reveal his intention to take legal measures against Sepp Blatter and FIFA's Ethics Committee in response to his six-year suspension, including a visit to the Court of Arbitration for Sport by early next week. Chung said he plans on suing Blatter for embezzlement of 3.7 million U.S. dollars from the Visa MasterCard sponsorship deal and not disclosing his salary. 
He will also take legal measures with the Ethics Committee for defamation in response to unjust sanctions. Earlier on Thursday, FIFA's Ethics Committee suspended its former vice president for six years and fined him 103,000 U.S. dollars, while FIFA President Sepp Blatter, UEFA Chief Michel Platini, and FIFA Secretary General Jehom Valk received a provisional ban of 90 days after being investigated for embezzlement and bribery. Tong Mongjun has been accused of vote trading after writing a letter to FIFA executive members in 2010. In the letter, Chung explained that Korea's bid committee planned to create a global football fund should Korea host the 2022 World Cup. Lee ji Arirang News. It was an exciting day at the President's Cup here in Korea as the international team made progress to catch up with Team USA after a dismal start yesterday. The international team gained three and a half points today. But the U.S. team will go into Saturday's morning foursomes with a five-and-a-half to four-and-a-half lead. Louis Ustesen and Brandon Grace were paired again after winning the only point for the international team yesterday. The duo displayed great chemistry again, beating world number one Jordan Spieth and Dustin Johnson. Making highlight reel worthy moments were the Korean duo of Danny Lee and Pae Sang Moon, who came from behind to edge out their U.S. opponents on the 18th hole. Bear coolly sank the winning putt and drove the crowd wild. Every moment mattered to the young golfer as this is his last competitive tournament before beginning his two-year mandatory military service in Korea. NASA has released stunning new images of Pluto revealing the distant dwarf planet as blue skies and regions of red water ice. For the latest in a number of remarkable discoveries for NASA this year, let's turn to our Kwon Jang Ho. Blue skies, just like home. This is the latest picture of Pluto sent from the New Horizons space probe. Particles in Pluto's atmosphere is dispersing the sunlight to produce the hazy blue halo. The unexpected discovery has delighted NASA, with New Horizons' principal investigator describing it as gorgeous. And it is helping to better understand the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Regions of water ice have also been found, as highlighted here in blue, but they actually appear to be bright red in colour. NASA scientists have been at a loss to explain it, saying more research is needed. New Horizons has travelled more than 3 billion miles over nine years to become the first probe to reach Pluto. Since July, it has been sending back breathtaking pictures of the planet and its moon Charon. NASA has had a remarkable few months. Just two weeks ago, it announced the discovery of flowing water on the surface of Mars, increasing the possibility of finding life on the red planet. There was also the discovery of Kepler-452b in July, nicknamed Earth 2.0, the most Earth-like planet found so far. In recent years, NASA has come under criticism for high costs, failed programs and intangible benefits. But with discoveries and pictures like these, it is helping to reawaken man's imagination and curiosity of the universe. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. Now for international headlines, we turn to our Bruce Harrison at the News Center. But before focusing on the death of inmates in a fire at an overcrowded prison in the Philippines and how some Volkswagen owners only care about satisfying their need for speed regardless of whatever, Bruce, let's first start with a major accomplishment for the small country of Tunisia, its struggle for democracy. And I think it's not an understatement or an overstatement to say that this country was certainly under the radar in terms of nominees for the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, definitely, Daniel. Tunisia is a young democracy and it still has a long way to go. So a group of Tunisians winning the Nobel Peace Prize will definitely encourage that government to continue in the direction it's heading. Our Yi Su Un has more on the humbled winners. To everyone's surprise, the honor of this year's Nobel Peace Prize went to the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet for its decisive contribution to the building of a pluralistic democracy in Tunisia. The quartet, formed in the North African nation in 2013, is a coalition of four civil society organizations, each representing different values and sectors in the country. 
Following the Jasmine Revolution in 2011, a resistance movement for democracy, which ended with the overthrow of the authoritarian Zain al Abidine Ben Ali regime, Tunisia was facing a possible civil war. In the midst of social and political unrest, it was the quartet that enabled the nation's citizens, political parties and authorities to hold constructive dialogues towards democracy and establish a constitutional system of government with a constituent assembly voted through elections. The Norwegian committee recognized the quartet's role as a mediator and driving force behind the democratic advancement. Encouragement was the central message behind the decision. The committee chairman credited the quartet for laying the groundwork for a national fraternity in hopes that it will serve as an example to other nations. This year, some 273 candidates, just five short of last year's record number, were nominated for the prize, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Pope Francis. Lee Suen, Arirang News. An overcrowded prison in the Philippines has burned, leaving 10 inmates dead. This was a second fire in two years at the penal colony in the central Philippine province of Leyte, and a sign the country's prison system is in need of an overhaul. The local fire marshal said five of the dead victims were found inside a cell they shared with 12 other inmates. He added it took two hours to bring the fire under control. The whole maximum security compound was struck by the fire, so everyone inside the cells were caught in the blaze. The death toll could have been much higher, but many of the prisoners were taking part in a sporting event outdoors. The International Center for Prison Studies said the Philippine prison system is the fourth most overcrowded in the world. Volkswagen's top U.S. executive says it could take years to fix the cars in the United States that have faulty emission software, and it turns out some Americans will unlikely be interested in the fix. Volkswagen's U.S. operations chief Michael Horn testified before a congressional committee in Washington and apologized, saying his company had no knowledge of the cheating. But this was a couple of software engineers who put this in for whatever reasons. It was the first public questioning in the U.S. of a VW executive since the scandal erupted. Last month, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency said Volkswagen fitted some diesel cars with software capable of cheating emissions test. 2016 will undoubtedly be a difficult year for Volkswagen sales in the U.S. The German automaker said it's already withdrawn its certification application in the U.S. for some 2016 model year diesel-powered vehicles. Some American drivers are expected to decline the software fix as it would lower performance and fuel economy, meaning a slower, shorter ride. And that's a glimpse of the world today. Have a great weekend. Hello, I'm Yi Jihyun with the latest weather updates. It was a beautiful hunger day we had today, but temperatures were clearly on the cooler side compared to previous days. And tomorrow seems to be even chillier with rain expected for most of the day. And following the precipitation, temperatures will drop on Sunday with the mercury only rising to 15 degrees Celsius here in Seoul with a chance of sporadic showers during the day. And for tomorrow, 5 to 12 20 millimeters of precipitation are anticipated for the central parts of the nation, including here in the capital. Uh, and it's forecast to rain from early in the morning till the evening, so please bear that in mind. In the meantime, southern coastal regions in Jeju Island will be under mostly two partly sunny skies. On that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. The lowest hour will start out at 12 before getting up to 17, while big gaps in temperatures are expected for for Daegu with a low of 9 and a high of 23 and Gwangju and Busan will be topping out at 22 tomorrow afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 20 and 23 while Tokdo rises to 19. Now despite the chilly weekend, the weather outlook for next week looks promising with skies to be clear and sunny, temperatures returning to the seasonal averages. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe.
That's primetime news for you this week. We'll have more coming up at midnight Korea time with our regularly scheduled newscast. For now, thank you for watching.